Well, thank you everyone for coming. Really appreciate it. This is our first workshop session. Uh, we'll try to keep it brief. I'm going to have a great uh, period for questions and answers at the end, and we'll dive into a bunch of stuff. Um, so I won't kill you with the slides for too long, uh, but hopefully going to give you some context to Kubernetes. Uh, first context on who I am. Uh, if you don't know, my name is Brennan O'Leary, uh, and I'm from Annapolis, Maryland, here in the States, uh, born and raised in Maryland. I mean, what we're going to talk about uh, is a few things, right? We're going to talk about what Kubernetes is, but I think more importantly, and I think the context that really helps when talking to customers about it is like, why is Kubernetes? Uh, and then we'll go into some Kubernetes terminology. So that's as kind of deep as we'll get. Uh, we're not going to do a lot of hands-on stuff in this session. The slides will be available, and there's a hands-on tutorial there. Uh, but this is mostly just going to be, let's talk about it, let's give context, uh, and then let's get questions answered. And then we've got a couple fun stuff, fun things, because it's me. So uh, first off, you know, what, what is Kubernetes, right? And so you'll hear it called a lot of different things. You'll hear people say, well, it's a container scheduler. You'll hear people say it's a desired state manager. You'll hear people say it's an orchestrator. Right? All these things just basically boil down to it's a system that keeps the system how we want it to be, which sounds kind of crazy, but when we're a software company for software companies, you can you know, relate a little bit. Right? And so like, let's talk to kind of understand where more it is, what it is more, let's talk a little bit about where GitLab and Kubernetes meet. Right? So when I'm talking to folks, um, one of the things I say is before I came to GitLab, I came to GitLab in 2017, and before I did, um, the only executives of any company I heard talking about Kubernetes were our VP of product and Sid, our CEO. Um, and so there's a number of touch points. We've been kind of all in on Kubernetes for a while. So one is, of course, you can run GitLab on Kubernetes, because Kubernetes, I mean, GitLab is an application. Uh, so we allow you to deploy GitLab to your Kubernetes cluster if that's where you want to run GitLab. And that could help you if you're already running other things on Kubernetes. Uh, it's a great way to keep uh, apps alive and running uh, and highly available. Uh, and so it might make sense to run GitLab in your Kubernetes cluster. And so things you'll hear about, and we'll talk more in detail later, are like Helm charts, right? So we publish a Helm chart. It's basically a descriptive way of saying, here, uh, this is how you install GitLab into a Kubernetes cluster. But the other and perhaps more important place that like GitLab and Kubernetes intersect is GitLab's ability to interface and interact and integrate with Kubernetes itself for deploying the apps that our customers are writing and storing in GitLab, right? So you store your source code in GitLab, you probably, you might hopefully, of course I'm gonna be biased, but hopefully you're doing your CI in GitLab. Uh, and then <clears throat> with the GitLab Kubernetes integration that we have a whole team in the configure team de dedicated to, uh, you can deploy that app automatically. So all the great things we talk about in auto DevOps, like automatic review apps, uh, the ability to run SaaS and DAS automatically, that all basically relies on, hey, if we're connected to a Kubernetes cluster, we know how to deploy your app. And so that's really where GitLab, and we'll talk in more detail about it later, uh, comes into play when, it's, when I want to deploy all of my applications I'm writing into Kubernetes. So it's a two, different, two different touch points, and we'll, we'll go into more detail. Um, oh, and of course, I don't have my slides up. So yes, using Kubernetes to run GitLab as an application, or using Kubernetes, oh, and then also the third touch point uh, is we are working on moving our production system, gitlab.com, into a Kubernetes cluster. So we recently, as you may remember or have heard, uh, moved our infrastructure from Microsoft Azure to Google Cloud Platform. Uh, and the reason, one of the main reasons for that was we want to run GitLab dot com at the scale that it is inside of a Kubernetes cluster so that it's able to scale and, and keep up with demand even better than it is today. And GCP has kind of been on the forefront of running Kubernetes in the cloud, and so that's why we chose, chose to go that way. So we're not running it yet. Um, we're talking about which pieces of infrastructure first go into Kubernetes, um, but, but that's another way. And then, of course, like I said, GitLab can be a platform to run your applications on Kubernetes, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So to kind of answer the question, like, why is Kubernetes, I want to do a little, like, history lesson um, through deploying applications, right? If you're a software, to, well, first on Kubernetes and then through uh, deploying applications. So, so Kubernetes originated <coughs> at Google when you're a software developer and you want to deploy an application. There's a system called Borg. Uh, and this system basically 
is agnostic to you, the developer, as to where the hardware is, what kind of hardware there is, how much hardware there is. You just say, I've got a new mail app that I wrote, I'm calling it Gmail, uh, and I want it to run on 10,000 servers globally distributed. And Borg just goes and figures it out and does it. Right? So the infrastructure team at Google enables their developers to deploy as fast as they do through Borg. So <clears throat> that's a closed source inside Google solution. But in 2015, uh, some Google engineers started a project called Project 7 to create an open source version of Borg in ways. It's not exactly Borg, but they took everything they learned from Borg and the stuff that they were OK making open source and created this open source project uh, called uh, Project 7. And then that, at the end uh, or summer of 2015, evolved into what became version 1.0 of Kubernetes, right? So now it's known as Kubernetes. Uh, and that was then, there was then a foundation created, the CNCF, you'll hear that a lot, Cloud Native Computing Foundation, that was founded by Google and the Linux Foundation together in order to house Kubernetes, and now it houses lots and lots of projects and incubates even more. Then, this is what I was kind of talking about um, earlier. In 2016, I've put the dark ages here. Or, and I've got a picture of Betamax. And so what this was is, at the same time, uh, Docker, uh, who is a company around Docker containers, uh, had a project called Docker Swarm. And it was kind of this, who's going to win between Docker Swarm and Kubernetes? So everybody's talking about it. And then as I said earlier, you could hear lots of folks debating it on Hacker News or you know, forums and engineers debating the, the merits of both. But the only folks that I saw, this, I wasn't at GitLab yet, and the only folks I saw really talking about it seriously at an executive level were ours. Um, I was a GitLab customer at the time, so I would watch videos that we posted. And, uh, and Sid was convinced Kubernetes is the future, <laughs> where we're, we're going to be all in on that. And it was at the 20, end of 2017 that we were kind of, and he was kind of, uh, vindicated, uh, because you can kind of see 2017 as when Betamax of Docker Swarm goes away, and the VHS of Kubernetes wins because Amazon goes all in, comes up with uh, EKS, their version of running Kubernetes in the cloud. Uh, our Azure comes out with AKS. And actually, the thing I used to point out to folks, I'm not sure if it's true anymore, but if you went to docker.io, it said Kubernetes. I said, if you needed any more proof <laughs> that Kubernetes won over Docker Swarm, it's that when you go to docker.io, the first thing you see is, hey, you can run Docker in Kubernetes. Uh, and so <clears throat> that was critical because that was an open source project winning, right? Like Docker Swarm, I, I actually don't know. It may have had an open source component. Anybody knows? I don't know if it did or did not. But it was, you know, it was mostly a platform for them to sell as part of their commercial offering. Uh, and so that's a big reason that Kubernetes ended up winning uh, that. And then here uh, I pointed out, if you can read it, that uh, Kubernetes is from Greek. It means helmsman or pilot. Uh, that's why you see kind of like a Helm logo, and you see a lot of ship, right? It's a lot about ships. Um, and so let's talk a little bit more about why we wanted to go down this road. Uh, and so the reason I want to talk about it is because I think if you know the why behind Kubernetes, it becomes a lot more obvious why a lot of our customers are talking about it, why people seem excited about it, even though it's kind of still up in the air as to how it works. So. Let's talk about if you wanted to deploy an application, right? You write some software, you've checked it into GitLab, and you want to deploy it so that people can use it. You know, the original version of that was, OK, you've got a computer. A bare, you, know, you might hear people say bare metal, meaning just a computer. And that computer has the kernel and the libraries that are on top of it. And then you put your apps on it, right? And so this is where technologies like Puppet and Chef are really great at, hey, I've got a bunch of computers out here. like. Put my apps. He put this app here. Put this app here, and you, you figure out where you're going to deploy everything. Then, after that came an abstraction away from that model called virtual machines, right? And so a virtual machine actually takes one physical computer and breaks it into multiple entire computers virtually, right? So it's not a real computer, but it's for all intents and purposes it is because it has the whole kernel, all the libraries, and can have all your apps in it, right? So then the next abstraction that came was the idea of containers, right? So why do we need a copy of the operating system every time on the same computer, right? That's, that's what a virtual machine is. 
copy the operating system, copy the operating system on every virtual machine that's running. Uh, so the container takes that away. It says just run one operating system at the computer level, put Docker or there's other container technologies on top, and then you can have a container that just contains the library and the app you want to build. So when I'm saying library, um, it could be things like you know, Java or Node, right? the things that we're building the app with. The problem with this is you start to get away from what a human can kind of understand, right? It's kind of easy to understand, like that computer is my email server, and that computer is running my web app, and that computer is running my point of sale app. Um, but very quickly now, we've got all these abstractions in place, and it's kind of hard to understand, like, where is stuff, right? Um, and so I've kind of illustrated that here, right? So, you, you, again, if you, it, it's easy to grok and figure out where stuff is, but as you get more and more containers and you, you separate concerns, it's great technically, it has a huge advantage technically, but it really kind of creates a mess as to wait, how are we managing all of these, these containers, right? And there's another problem, right? So bare metal, virtual machines, containers, these all still to some extent assume you know what's going on with the computer that's running them, right? And if that computer goes out, it's on you to figure out what to do, right? So computers break all the time. It's a thing that happens. I've heard that something like Google, and we've got some folks that have worked at Google before here, they'll know better than me, but replaces something like a thousand servers a day because computers just break. Um, and, and so with any of these other solutions, you have to monitor for that and Puppet has to watch, you have to have Puppet and orchestrating or something like it, orchestrating, hey, what computers are running and what's not and health check and all this stuff. Kubernetes is really very self-healing, right? You just throw a bunch of hardware at Kubernetes uh, and it's going to figure out the best way to run it. That's, that's one of the big benefits of Kubernetes. You can kind of think of it if you, if you know about RAID systems um, for hard drives, right? Random array of inexpensive disks. The idea you put a bunch of disks together, you do some, there's a lot of different complicated things you do against them, but now you have one bigger disk. Same idea with Kubernetes. And if one of those disks, you pull it out and you throw it against the wall, Everything still works. So let's uh, next talk about some key terms, and that will that'll help us unpack like the 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 concepts behind Kubernetes. Because you'll hear a lot of these terms thrown around, especially when you work at GitLab, and we're talking about Kubernetes all the time. Uh, so, so I want to spend some time just kind of simplifying what they are. So first. Um, Again, we talked about container scheduler, desired state manager, right? These things are to help you try to understand what Kubernetes is, right? Basically, I say, I want my app to run like this. It's going to need three front end nodes. It's going to need a database. It's going to need uh, this kind of, let these people in through this, kind of, this port. Um, and you state that. And then again, Kubernetes is the orchestrator, the manager that places all of those things in the disparate hardware. It doesn't care where, you don't care where. You don't have to figure out, oh, this app needs two gigabits of memory, and this app needs a gigabyte, and this app needs 500K, so let me figure out how much memory I have on different computers and, and distribute it. It just figures that out. So some terms you'll hear, you'll hear pod, node, and cluster. Right? And so I've got those kind of in order here. Cluster refers to kind of the largest set uh, of, of things in Kubernetes. So this is the entirety of all of the machines that are running Kubernetes uh, that are where your application is running, right? A node represents one uh, physical or virtual device there, right? So you can think of it, a node as a computer, right? So I have three nodes. It means I've got three computers. Those are the where, where my uh, applications are going to run. And then a pod is where the containers themselves are actually running. So a cluster has many nodes. A node's going to have many pods, probably. One or many pods. Uh, and so that's kind of how that breaks down. And the pod just is a, a unit that says, these are the containers that represent the front end website, or these are the containers that represent the payment system. The other side, of again, kind of have that same hierarchy between deployment, replicas, and service. So a deployment uh, just talks about deploying one set of applications or set of containers. Replica says, well, how many of those do I want to run at a given time? And then service says, what are all of the deployments that make up a service, right? So again, if we think about it in the GitLab world, if you're familiar with the GitLab architecture, you have to have Postgres database, you have to have a Redis caching layer, 
You have to have machines that are running Rails uh, to run the actual web app. Those might be deployments, but GitLab as a service might be GitLab. So we'll go a little deeper into each of these. Um, and so these de definitions are actually taken off Kubernetes website. Again, they're trying to <laughs> expose to the world you know, all these terms that are just ways of abstracting the way we think of things. Um, so again, the node is a worker machine. It could be a physical computer. It could be a virtual machine. Most of the time, it's a virtual machine, actually. Uh, but it has a whole operating system on it. Uh, and then it also has Docker on it, probably. Uh, and then it has one or many pods running on it. So here we can see the outline where there is um, the kubelet, which is just the way that Kubernetes controls the node, uh, and Docker that are running on the node itself. And then we see the pods inside. And again, a pod can have one container in it. A pod could have a container and a data store in it. A pod could have many containers in it. Um, but we can see all of those broken down there. And then again, the, the highest level abstraction is the cluster. So here we see that little node that we just saw. We kind of zoomed out. And we've got three nodes and a master in this cluster. So the master is uh, what is kind of orchestrating and telling uh, the nodes what to run. Um, and then uh, it is going to have many nodes that it can then distribute to. And again, those nodes don't have to be identical. Uh, they can be you know, various different pieces of, uh, of hardware and different size. Um, they may have some that are there with GPUs for really fast machine learning processing and some that are slower that are fine for backend processes to run. Uh, but all of those nodes together make up the cluster. So then uh, let's dig a little deeper into a service. I kind of talked about that a little bit. So a service uh, can span a number of pods, right? And it's a set of pods that logically make sense to get together and then have a policy about who can access them, right? Um, and so I have this thing below that say, pods come and go, but a service is forever, right? A pod is going to get scheduled into a node, but if that node were to go away, the fact that this pod uh, is a member of the service means I've got to go find somewhere else to make, that, make a new pod that has this thing running in it, right? And so it's going to keep all of those things. At the top of this, we can see a, uh, a service B that has uh, three pods, uh, each of which have you know, one app inside of them. Uh, but we need all of those things to be running at all times. And so if something were to happen to uh, the one on the left, it would probably reschedule that, that pod into the other node. So that's kind of like the really basic, basic uh, terminology. Uh, there's a lot more <laughs> detailed terminology, obviously. Uh, I'm just going to run through these real quick. Uh, again, we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. Uh, but I do want to kind of just touch on those other words you'll hear uh, when you're talking about Kubernetes. So one thing you hear is namespace. Uh, this is really critical because one of the, the, the best parts and the, and the beauty behind Kubernetes is, again, the original design of Borg, if we go back to that history lesson, which is, as the infrastructure team, I want to just provide hardware to my developers and, and people that run apps. And as a developer, I don't want to care about it, where, where it's running. But you can imagine in a large organization, you know, there's folks that are running apps that uh, are finance, fin financial apps that only a certain subset of people can have access to. Um, you, you might not even want the developers to be able to you know, get on and, and do anything against that. And now in Kubernetes, you've kind of got uh, a seemingly kind of wild west that this node could have anybody's pods running on it, right? Uh, w w there's no guarantee about where they're running. So a namespace is another concept that Kubernetes uses to, to separate uh, logically a whole set of services and pods and deployments and everything that is within Kubernetes can be separated by namespace uh, so that it can be multi-tenant from the beginning. Uh, and so that's really critical because that's why a lot of our enterprise customers are so interested in Kubernetes because it really allows them to have this separation that is going to meet their regulation, the regulations that are placed on them, but then also you know, make efficient use of the hardware or, or the cloud hardware that they're buying. Uh, you'll talk, hear people talk about ingress and load balancing. So this is just basically to say that um, by default, you know, stuff's running, but you can't get to it. You have to explicitly say what, is, what traffic is allowed into um, my service. Uh, and then load balancing is just something that's kind of built in. Uh, there's a number of different ways to achieve it. Um, but obviously, if you have multiple apps or multiple copies of the same container that's running your app, you're going to need to balance the load coming in between that. Um, 
persistent volumes. Uh, so uh, again, this is, is a very you know, uh, ephemeral kind of way of looking at the world, right? We said I can take one of the computers, throw it against the wall, and, it's, and everything's still running. But obviously, uh, my data, I need persistent data. Uh, so there's a whole other subset of Kubernetes about how you deal with persistent volumes and things that are stateful versus the stateless you know, apps uh, that are running. Uh, and then, you know, it also allows um, for those things that we that we help enable, which is like rolling updates to your pods, right? So because you have this kind of distributed workload, you can slowly update uh, your app uh, over time. You know, enables canary, things like Canary and blue green deployment. It really enables a lot of that. And then, lastly, you'll hear people say kubectl. We'll come we'll come back to that one uh, in a minute. Um, so yeah, yeah, Kubernetes in practice. So this um, is where I'm trying to kind of, <laughs> this is probably the most dense slide that I have, but I'm trying to kind of demystify, uh, again, those multiple touch points that we have with Kubernetes, because they're two very separate concerns, right? Um, and, and the separate concerns we're talking about here, um, I'm gonna use very non dev y terminology so that we can understand it. The purple is dev, and the white is ops, right? So on one side, on the white side, if you're gonna run Kubernetes and you're an organization, you have to have folks that know how to run Kubernetes maybe uh, and, and maintain uh, the cluster. So that's one way to do it, right? You can spin up your own cluster and add your nodes to it. Uh, there's all kinds of different things that you can do to it. Um, but where that's made easy and where everyone's you know pushing towards uh, is is a cloud provider, right? What a cloud provider does is make that part really consumable. So when, instead of having to use the command line and spin up my own machines and connect them all together, I can go into Google, say, I want a new cluster, I want it to have four nodes, and I have it, right? That same disparity exists on the dev side of the house uh, if you think about deploying apps. Again, very possible to do kind of on your own. You can write a lot of YAML and describe your application in YAML. You could use Helm charts, which are kind of a more, uh, an easier way to use that, uh, but it's still a lot of work. Um, and you're still gonna be interacting a lot and using a lot of command line tools to get it working. So the idea of that piece of, that we talked about earlier about GitLab deploying your apps is we wanna be that same easy button, if you will, uh, that Google is for creating a cluster uh, for deploying the apps. Right? And so that's where auto Helm charts, automatic deployment comes in. We basically recognize what kind of app you have, uh, automatically create a Helm chart for you, automatically monitor your cluster, um, and then bring that all back into the development lifecycle. So that, that kind of is, again, it's complicated, but it's just two separate concerns, and, and it kind of shows the, the use case we're going for with our, with our customers and, and how we would you know, try to uh, educate our customers about what we're what we're doing with Kubernetes. Uh, again, the slides will be available, so we'll have this uh, hands-on exercise you can do. It walks you through it uh, one by one. Um, but f we'll just end with a couple of little fun things. Um, so uh, one is uh, K8s. You see K8s a lot. Um, it's it's really not that complicated. Uh, the way you spell Kubernetes is K, eight other letters, and then an S. So that's hard to do. It's easier to write K8S, and so that's what you end up with. Um, how do you pronounce, pronounce Kubernetes? So uh, again, I've got a link in the slides to the eight different ways you can pronounce Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes, um, I, I, I think I say it the same way every time Kubernetes, but I may not. Um, and then uh, I, Jason Plum pointed out to me that this debate is supposedly settled, although I have, some, I have a counterpoint to him. So kubectl is the, is the uh, control that you use, the, the command line tool that you use to interact with Kubernetes. And some folks say it should be pronounced kubectl. Uh, and, or, but you also could be kube control. I mean, that's what it really stands for. Um, but kubectl is kind of nice. I like it a lot better. Um, I think that the Kubernetes website now specifically says it's uh, kubectl, um, or maybe kubectl, it says it's not kubectl. Uh, but I found out that someone embedded uh, IDs in the SVG version of the Kubernetes logo that says it's pronounced kubectl. So I'm sticking with kubectl for now. 
And the other thing that Jason didn't like from this presentation, but I keep it, kept it anyway, is I'm trying to change the pronunciation of GitLab Cuttle or GitLab CTL to GitLab Cuttle because I, I think that's great. So you're all on Team GitLab Cuttle now. All right. So how do we make Kubernetes a game? Again, this is kind of a cool thing. There's a uh, whack-a-mole game where you actually it spins up a Kubernetes cluster and you can like punch uh, a, a node with the, like the hammer from whack-a-mole and the node goes away and another one pops back up. Right? Great little explanation. And then someone actually did sp also spend the time to make that into a physical device. So there's like a physical like DJ keypad that has lights on, you know, lit, lit buttons where you can actually control your Kubernetes cluster uh, like a DJ. So if you're really into it, after you take Jason's lesson, you can then go, go build that. Uh, there's also a Kubernetes children's book. I uh, highly recommend it. Uh, there's videos that go along with it. Um, and it's a whole, uh, it's a giraffe and I think an owl, I don't know what that little guy is. Uh, and they're you know, exploring the world of, of Kubernetes. Uh, that's all I've got for you. Thanks. So, so as promised, it, is not, it was not an hour long. We have t plenty of time uh, for questions. Mm -hmm. Well, there's some nuance with respect to that. Sure, sure. Yeah, so um, Helm, uh, again, is this uh, system. Uh, Helm kind of is the charts, the, the, the descriptive language, if you will, um, the YAML that describes how do I want to describe a service and a deployment, et cetera. Uh, how that actually, you take those just text files, right? Helm, you can think of Helm as just the text files. Um, how you take those text files and then actually interpret that into Kubernetes commands is through what's called Tiller. Um, and so I think then you also, the second part of your question was asking about how that relates to like Red Hat and OpenShift. Right, so uh, <clears throat> OpenShift uh, from Red Hat is kind of their take on Kubernetes, right? So it's Kubernetes and then Red Hat builds on top of it, which is Red Hat's business model, right? That's what, um, the, you know, CentOS is the open source version of uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, uh, same idea. Uh, so they have not added support for Tiller yet, or at least last time I looked at them, they didn't, uh, which makes it harder for us to use our existing integration to an OpenShift cluster. Having said that, I think that we're doing a lot of work on OpenShift right now. I think that's like actually the focus of the configure team, um, but I don't know. Daniel Grousseau would know in great detail um, what the configure team's plans are around that. And I'm just gonna go look if I can tell you quickly, but. Do, do, do. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure. I, if, you, if you can't find out from Daniel, let me know, Jim. And, but he should, I, I would definitely recommend, you know, it might be, it might be smart to, if, if he is working on that, like have a public sector call where he talks about where we're going with that. Because it's a, it's a concern for us. It's, we want to be able to integrate just as well with it. Um, but it just, it's, I think it's just some more legwork um, to do. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, um, this is kind of from a sales perspective, I guess, but sure. uh, I've been told there are different distributions of Kubernetes, and uh, I'm just wondering, does GitLab work with all of them? So if we're talking to customers, do we have to, um, you know, clarify what distribution of Kubernetes? I've been told that we work with, like, generic uh, mm -hmm. dis Kubernetes, but if it's something, there are other distros out there that are not generic that we may not work as well with. So. I'm just wondering if you can talk about you know the number of distributions and how they sure. interact with GitLab. Sure. Yeah, I don't necessarily have the most up-to-date information on how many there are, um, but yes, we're building against the open-source um, canonical distribution of Kubernetes. Right. The CNCF is there, there's no question who um, is in charge of the the main project Kubernetes. That is the CNCF, uh, and that's what we're integrating with. Um, OpenShift, in some ways, is another distribution of Kubernetes. Right. Um, you could you could call it that. Um, and then I know there are some others. Um, there may be folks in the room that are, are more aware of them than I. Um, so I would say that it's unlikely, I think, I mean, that anyone besides someone at the scale of a red hat would have a distribution that was so different that our stuff wouldn't work with it, but it's possible. So it's definitely a concern. I wouldn't bring it up in every conversation. Oh, wait, let me just check your distribution. 
but if you get an inkling that there may be something funny going on. If I was an enterprise customer, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to, use, I wouldn't want to use, again, some other distribution that's not very well used, right? Like, <laughs> I'd use OpenShift, I'd use main Kubernetes. To go to another distribution, that's a big bar, that's a high bar, and, and, a, and a big risk for me at this point. Now, that could change in a year, um, but at this point, that would be a big, a big risk for me. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, when we built that, EKS was really in its infancy. Uh, I don't know. I'm sure there's an issue open, probably. Um, I'm, not, I'm not in charge of that part of the product, so I don't know how prioritized that's going to be. Um, there's... There's some differences about how Amazon implemented it uh, that make it a little less clean um, to have a third party spin up. There's actually a whole separate um, project COPS. I talked to, I did, it was in the slide, I don't think I talked to it. Um, K-O-P-S, that stands for Kubernetes Ops. Um, and really, that's the only way, I mean, you can point and click around and you probably can use the Amazon API, but COPS is really the most mature way to deploy um, a cluster that's not in Google. So Google really is just still pretty far ahead. Um, but I think if, I would say that yes, we'd want to integrate. The question would be, are, are there APIs mature enough that now's the right time? I don't know. <laughs> so the question was about uh, Google TechCon. Um, is, it, is it competition or something we want to integrate with? I mean, I think in some ways it is competition, right? So TechCon, um, so that will give you a lot of context. Uh, Another foundation was just formed this year uh, called the CDF, which is the Continual Delivery Delivery Foundation. I was just making sure I had the right, I don't think it's, yeah, continu Continuous Delivery Foundation. Uh, and Jenkins and Jenkins X have been put into that foundation as founding members. And then also TechCon, which like everyone's heard of Jenkins, only a few people have heard of that. Uh, and the reason for that is, uh, you know, uh, it, it's a big focus from the Jenkins community to try and mature uh, the tooling around deploying to Kubernetes, right? Um, they have, um, I, I always say that one of their biggest disadvantages is they were written first, Jenkins to us, like if, I, if I'm talking about them, right? Like we, we've matured and, and come to age uh, in a time of containers being the way to do things. Uh, so I think it is competition from that perspective of like, they're, that's trying to catch up with us, is what it is. But we integrate with Jenkins today, and so why would we not integrate with TechCon if a customer needed it tomorrow? Because if you don't know it, you're not Yeah, that's a good question. It, it, that's, that's a tough one. Um, I, I can see both, both, uh, both sides of that. I mean, OpenShift is Kubernetes right. to a technical person, right? Um, and so to just like copy and paste the configuration we have and put the word OpenShift on it is maybe not the best idea, but there's probably, there's probably other ways to, to solve that that I'm not thinking of on stage right now that we should probably maybe explore with. Again, it's gonna be Daniel and his team. Um, I think it'd be smart for Daniel, again, I'm just completely throwing him under the bus, but like a public sector call, sector call with Daniel would be really smart thing, thing to do. <laughs> Hi there. Thank you for the intro. Um, can you recommend a definitive resource to use to teach people about Kubernetes? Yeah. So, uh, do you want to learn? Uh, so, th do you want to learn more about it, or do you want to like put your hands on Kubernetes? I guess is the question. Um, I'd like a resource like the ProGit book, which kind of takes you from zero to hero. In, sure, in sure. Um, I, so, there's a couple. I will post them with my slides when I post them. Yep. Um, I can't think of them off the top of my head, but I'll find them. In the, in the slides today are, is a great hands-on tutorial, which I think is, I, that's how I like to learn. Um, but I'll, I'll try to, I know of a couple other resources like that that I'll try to add to the slides as well. Thank you. Before I post them. Brendan, I've got a resource I can add to your material. Awesome, um, yeah, I'm around, sure it's editable, so great. Around security. So oh, cool. I did a presentation around securing Kubernetes, and so I did a lot of research on how you can hack it and you might want to include that. I'll yeah, no, that would be great. That would be really great. Yeah, I didn't touch on that at all. I know Jason will talk a, a lot more about um, you know, the boundaries that you need to set up when you're actually deploying apps in the, the 102 session this afternoon. Sure. 
Sure. Yeah, um, the biggest challenge is it's a hot topic, right? Uh, so let's, let, again, let's go back to the history of Kubernetes. Who built Kubernetes? Google, right? How many of our customers have the scale of a Google when it comes to software deployments? Not many, right? Um, so like kind of everyone sees Kubernetes as a hammer right now and everything's a nail. Um, that's obviously not true at all. Kubernetes is really great for what it's good for, um, but it's not uh, necessarily you know, a panacea solution, which any new tech thing that comes out, people assume is a panacea solution. Uh, it's really complicated to run yourself. So if your thing is, well, our infrastructure is too complicated, we're going to Kubernetes, you're, you're going to have a bad time. Um, I mean, maybe if you go to a cloud provider, it's going to be okay, but you're going to want to have some expertise in it. Um, if, if what you need is highly available systems, right? So are we still recording, JT? Yep. Okay. Well, I'm about to talk about customers. So like Ticketmaster, um, like they need a lot of quick scale here and there, right? And they're all in on Kubernetes. It makes a lot of sense for them. Like that's exactly, Kubernetes is a fantastic place. Ticketmaster is a fantastic place for Kubernetes, right? Because that's what they need. They release, you know, uh, Ariana Grande tickets and it's like you gotta scale quick, right? Um, or wait, there's probably, there might have been Taylor Swift GIF. No, I went with Ariana Grande. Um, uh, so, like, yeah, so, like, that's, that's, I think, the biggest challenge that the customers are having is making sure they're not just doing it because it's cool. That's, that's a problem. Um, and, in fact, there's a, so there's, a, there's a person I recommend following heavily. She's in this slide. She's the one that's not a GIF. Uh, her name is Jessie Frazell. Um, she's, like, at Jess Fraz on Twitter. Uh, she was one of the uh, core maintainers of Kubernetes when she was at Docker. She worked at Microsoft for a long time. Um, she worked at GitHub. Uh, and she's been doing a lot of advocacy about what, like she loves Kubernetes, she helped write it, <laughs> uh, but she's doing a lot of advocacy about like don't use it when you don't need it. Um, and so she has a lot of great, she's got a great blog and, and some great talks out there that kind of talk about that, I definitely recommend it. That's why she's the one in the thing, it's like a little nod to dorks that might know her, like me. So right here. So you're talking about running GitLab on your Kubernetes cluster. Yeah. What's the difficulty? Hmm. Well, there. How much time do you have? <laughs> um, I mean, first of all, running applications in Kubernetes is tough, like I said. Running stateful applications in Kubernetes is really tough. Running a database inside of Kubernetes today is almost about, I mean, plenty of people do it, but I'm going to call it impossible. Um, and so GitLab has a lot of stateful information, right? The Git repositories uh, are a lot of information, lots of really small files, right? And so there's not a really great way today uh, to do that inside of Kubernetes. You probably are gonna need some sort of NFS or something behind it. We're, we're working on that. We've got a thing called Giddily uh, that's going to be able to shard and replicate and be much more of a cloud native way of storing Git data, uh, but it's not there yet. It's, it's in its 1.0, that's, that's 2.0 if you will. Um, the database is hard, right? Like today our Helm charts have a rip cord that you can pull so you can use uh, cloud provided uh, databases because it, like Amazon RDS is fantastic at running Postgres or Google Cloud is like fantastic at running Postgres. Like you, to, for you to try and replicate, you user to try and replicate that inside your Kubernetes cluster is not smart. Um, and, and so that's some of the challenges. There's a thousand other challenges that, again, Jason could talk your ear off about. Um, but that, again, GitLab being a complicated, stateful application is why I would forbid people from having to be their first Kubernetes uh, application. Jim. So if a, if a company wants to move towards containerization, do they have to do Kubernetes? They don't have to, no, no. Um, there are plenty of ways, I mean, Docker Swarm is still around. Uh, you can just do it, like you can just do containers in, with traditional tooling. Um, the difference here is like this whole cloud native discussion, right? Again, a very buzzy word, but I think it's an important one because if you're going to containers, you now have a different, a different kind of thing, right? And if you apply the tools that you have today to that, you can do it, but it's not gonna go great. Kubernetes is the different tool, right? 
Um, and so that's why so many people are talking about it, because they had that, uh, you know, a lot of people have done containers without Kubernetes and have that ship on the right, right? Um, and they don't know what's running where, they don't know what the security is, they, don't, you know, they have no control. Uh, Kubernetes gives them control. Um, so again, it's a use case specific of, if I'm trying to containerize, does that mean containerizing Kubernetes or just containerize? Um, you, if you're gonna get down that road eventually, you might as well bite it off in one, in my mind. Um, but if you're not, if you're just doing simple things, maybe not. Depends. Sorry, it depends is the worst answer. <laughs> but, but that is where we can help a lot, right? Like if you're doing that, that's where auto DevOps helps a lot, right? The auto DevOps, the concept of auto DevOps is you don't have a container, you don't have a Docker file, you don't, ha you don't understand a container, you just have your code. We're gonna containerize it, Helm chart it, push it to Kubernetes. And you're gonna be able to learn a lot about what we're doing, and it's all exposed to you, right? It's open source, and it's actually just a YAML file, and so you can learn a lot about, I mean, I learned Kubernetes through playing with GitLab, auto DevOps. It's a good question. Do you still need Puppet Chef and Ansible? Um, Puppet Chef and Ansible would say yes. Um, they have their use cases, I think, right? Um, I think that folks will still use them to, I think they'll have, I, think, I don't think everyone's gonna put everything in Kubernetes. I don't think that's realistic for many people, most people, except for maybe Google. Um, so yes, in that regard. Uh, and then I think you're gonna end up I think those tools will pivot and add, leverage their fantastic uh, you know, market share up to this point to, to provide tooling against Kubernetes that people are gonna want. I mean, if I was them, that would be the only thing I was thinking about, so. Great, thank you all so much for coming. I really appreciate it.